Thanks for getting my last name right as well. It's a very rare occurrence. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for your time today and thanks uh, to Paydirt for hosting uh, us today. Um, I'll take the cautionary statement there as read. This is also available online as well. Um, so my name is Francis Fadine. I'm the Managing Director of uh, Vulcan uh, Energy Resources, uh, the world's first zero carbon lithium uh, company and project. Um, we're a bit different, so we're not a traditional um, mining project. I'll explain how it works. Um, this is a combined um, renewables uh, and lithium chemicals project uh, based in Germany, and it will have two sources of revenue, so both from the renewable energy um, and from the, uh, the lithium chemicals production. Um, we are in the heart of the fastest growing lithium market in the world, the European market. We have the largest lithium resource in that market. Um, uh, potential for a very, very low OPEX operation, as well as a zero carbon one. So I think our key message is it doesn't necessarily need to cost more um, to be net zero carbon and to be green. We are fully funded to FID as well. We have a very strong cash position uh, and we have a very strong team of world leading experts in the company as well. So to start off, um, I just want to explain why we formed Vulcan in the first place. And um, I'm, I'm pretty excited because and I hope you are as well, because we're, we're going through a really a once in a century event at the moment. Um, that's not COVID. Um, so um, we are witnessing the complete electrification of global transport. This is not so evident in Perth, I'll grant you, but it is very evident in Europe. Um, it's very evident also in other parts of the world as well. This is accelerating extremely rapidly. We're also um, in tandem with this seeing the very rapid decarbonization of the globe, quite simply. Um, and that's uh, enabling mass rollouts of renewables and stationary storage as well, which also is a main driver for um, battery demand and therefore lithium demand. So in Europe, um, this is accelerating extremely quickly. Um, I've been told the EU Green Deal, which is a key enabler of this, is the largest public-private uh, investment program since the end of the Second World War. Um, it is a huge level of investment going into this. So what that means is Europe is developing its own lithium ion battery supply chain, all the way from raw materials through to finished product, the electric vehicle. Um, and the EU and federal and state governments are all very, very strongly behind this as well. Um, and what that means is uh, there is currently forecast 800 gigawatt hours of lithium ion battery capacity um, slated for Europe by 2030. This is, a lot of this is capex going into the ground now. Um, so this is real, this is happening. Um, that means, roughly, very roughly speaking, um, that uh, we're going to need 800,000 tonnes of lithium chemicals um, by 2030, and current global market, 350,000 tonnes, thereabouts. So we're talking about multiples of the current total global market just in Europe by 2030, and that's not very far away. And this means that the EU is the fastest growing lithium market in the world now. It has zero local supply of lithium hydroxide. 80% um, of the current global market is controlled by China. Europe does not want to be reliant on China for this critical raw material, and it has designated uh, lithium as being a critical raw material. So that's one part of why we formed Balkan. The other part is the um, high environmental footprints of the existing supply chain. Um, and I appreciate this is a bit of a, a shock figure, um, and it's, it's meant to be. Um, we've heard, already heard mention that the current uh, footprint of uh, hard rock lithium the carbon footprint is high. Um, brines are lower, but they have um, other footprints, such as water footprints, um, in the second driest place on Earth, usually uh, the Atacama Desert. Um, so there is an issue with the current supply chain, and that means that we have this paradigm shift in lithium demand. Um, we shouldn't have a very large carbon footprint coming with that increased demand. Um, so that's something that we want to correct. Um, and that's also being driven by the customer. Um, so Volkswagen was the first one to come out and say this. They want to produce a net zero carbon electric vehicle, including all the raw materials uh, in the supply chain. And um, they came out and said this first in 2018. Um, others have since followed suit. Daimler, BMW, um, Polestar, I heard today. Um, but really, it's all auto manufacturers now. Um, 
so they all want to produce net zero carbon EVs, including all the raw materials that go into those batteries. And the likes of Volkswagen have already said that they will prioritize low carbon sources of um, battery raw materials. Um, so they will use the sustainability of um, the product on par with price as a purchasing metric. So this has never happened before. This is a really interesting new paradigm in the industry and was a very major part of why we formed Vulcan. And this in turn is being driven by regulation. So you have the new EU battery regulation which essentially sets the clock ticking on high carbon batteries. From 27, 2027, you will no longer be able to buy a battery which was produced with a high carbon footprint within the EU. There is a labeling process first. Um, once that um, period is over by 2027, there will be thresholds set. And that includes the raw materials that goes into it as well. And this is part of the battery passport initiative as well with the Global Battery Alliance. Um, so the clock is ticking, essentially, um, to provide low carbon sources of battery materials. In addition, you've got the carbon border um, adjustment mechanism, which has been um, much talked about recently. Um, and I think we should be taking this very seriously here in Australia. Um, it covers chemicals as well. It's meant to come in by 2023. We'll hear more about it in July. Um, but what this means is effectively, if there's no uh, carbon price um, or no equivalent carbon price to the EU one, which is 57 euros a tonne currently, very, very high, um, in the country of origin for this raw material, it will be applied on entry to the European Union. Um, so someone has to pay for that cost. Um, so with that in mind, we started Vulcan um, really working from zero carbon lithium, work backwards, how do we get there? And we had the idea of um, Okay, so you have lithium production from brines. Um, you have these types of brines called geothermal brines, which are also a, uh, a source of renewable energy currently in Europe. And occasionally some of these brines are also rich in lithium. You need a third parameter as well. You need high flow rate um, so that uh, you get natural pressure um, and flow rate coming out of the ground. And we undertook a study to see where this could be done. Um, Initial indications show that these uh, types of resources are quite rare. One possible location was the Salton Sea in California. There's already a lot of activity there. Berkshire Hathaway Renewables, a big geothermal producer, um, is looking to do lithium production. Um, we went for the Upper Rhine Valley in Germany, um, obviously already very um, up the curve on the uh, European lithium demand. Um, where we've ended up since then is we've acquired a lot of data um, the Upper Rhine Valley is one of the world's most well-explored graben systems, I've been told. Um, so what that means is decades of oil and gas and geothermal exploration, um, a lot of seismic data, drilling data. Um, we've collated all of this together and we put together what is now Europe's largest lithium resource by quite a large margin. The significance of that being that um, when we speak to potential customers in Europe, they want to see a resource that can grow um, in production over time, and we just need to add more wells so we can grow in a relatively modular manner over time. How the project works? Well, um, simply put, we have this um, deep geothermal resource. Um, so it's a brine resource. Imagine um, almost like an oil and gas um, or an oil uh, reservoir at depth. Um, there's an inherent porosity and permeability within the reservoir rock. Um, we have this heated brine fluid, which is also rich in lithium. Um, we pump this fluid up to the surface, nothing new under the sun there, that's already being done in the Upper Rhine Valley to produce heat and in some cases electricity. Um, it is baseload renewable energy, which is obviously an advantage. Now usually what happens is that gets re-injected back into the reservoir. In this case we don't do that, we pass it through a co-located direct lithium extraction plant on site. Um, and more on that in a second. We take the lithium out of the brine in chloride form, we concentrate it um, and we um, are intending to barge it along the, the Rhine River um, to a chemical park just outside of Frankfurt, um, just up the road. We can also electric truck as well. It is very, very close by, so there'll sort of be a hub and spoke model. Critically, we don't use any fossil fuels for our energy requirements in this process, zero. So um, there are no carbon emissions coming out um, from our energy production. We get all the energy we need from the brine in the ground. In fact, we produce an excess of energy. So what will happen is we'll be selling our excess energy into the grid in terms of either heat or electricity, depending on the time of year, geothermal can do both. Um, so we'll be a net exporter, a net renewable energy exporter to the grid. 
Um, and Germany has a very favorable feed-in tariff, which is fixed for, the, um, for 20 years of the project's life for the energy that we can produce. Um, our carbon footprint is therefore net negative um, because we're actually displacing brown coal on the grid. Um, the brine still gets re-injected back into the reservoir. No chemicals are added. It's just um, taking the lithium out. Um, this is novel. No one's done this before. Um, but the various parts of it are, let's say, less novel. So we've got roughly three stages here. We've got the binary cycle geothermal plant. Our team in Germany has been developing these for decades in Germany and worldwide now. Um, we have, I'd say, the leading geothermal development teams, both subsurface and above surface, within Vulcan in-house. Um, so very much within our wheelhouse and already happening in Germany, plants have been operating for many years now successfully. The direct lithium extraction part, less well known, even in the lithium industry. Um, but it's a similar process. And DLE, direct lithium extraction, is an umbrella term rather than an unfortunate term. Um, but the type of process that we use is um, very similar to existing commercial operations that use this around the world, including um, the Phoenix operation in Argentina, um, which Livent owns. Um, so DLE projects actually already exist and account for a significant percentage of global lithium production. Um, and we're partnered, um, or we're collaborating with DuPont as one of the potential providers of the sorbent that we need. It's simply an, an, um, uh, um, an alumina-based sorbent that takes the lithium um, out of the brine and then you use a water strip to strip off the lithium and you recycle the sorbent. Um, so we're not using uh, reagents in this, in this case. And the central lithium plant, we have the option of just doing the traditional way, so um, lithium carbonate step first and then um, liming to produce lithium hydroxide. That's not our preferred way. Um, we rather do electrolysis, so chloralkali, um, which is not done for lithium, but it has been done for you know, over 100 years in the chloralkali industry because we have abundance um, renewable power. Um, so in that case, we produce a direct um, and very pure lithium hydroxide uh, product. Um, and then we can actually produce lithium carbonate after that if we need to, so we have full flexibility there. Um, this is what the project looks like. So it's kind of like a, a hub and spoke model. Um, you have uh, multiple geothermal plants built out across our license areas. Um, we will phase this um, and we'll have the central lithium plant at the, um, the center of the hub, um, which the uh, DLE plants will be feeding with that lithium chloride uh, concentrate, which is about 25%. Each uh, geothermal plant um, produces a slightly different amount of energy depending on its location and the heat beneath the surface. Um, so we will be producing 40,000 ton per annum um, from that operation, um, but obviously there'll be two steps to get there. So 15,000 ton per annum, then a 25,000 ton per annum lithium hydroxide operation. What that means is um, we have the potential for a very, very low um, OPEX operating cost um, operation indeed because we don't have the feedstock costs mainly, um, but also because, um, and even unlike existing DLE operations, for DLE to work, you need to heat up the brine our brine comes preheated. Imagine how much energy it takes to heat your kettle. Imagine doing that 4,000 meters up um, in the Atacama Desert. Um, it takes a lot of energy to do so. Our brine comes up preheated to the surface. So, um, and it comes up, um, once we've generated the electricity from it, it's the optimal temperature, sort of 60 to 80 degrees for the DLE to work. Um, so because of that inherent energy within the resource, that renewable energy, and because essentially we're treating a waste product here from the geothermal plant, means that once we're up and running, it's not a small capex operation by any means. We're building a renewable energy business and a lithium chemicals business. That is costly. But once we're up and running, we should be one of the lowest cost operations in the world. And what that means is we've already talked about zero carbon footprints, very low water footprints because of um, how DLE works. Um, but also, this is not a mine, which is important um, in Europe. It's not impossible to permit a mine in Europe, um, but it is difficult because it's de densely populated depending on where you are. And to be clear, we're in favor of mines in Europe. Europe will need um, mines in the traditional sense. Europe needs all the battery raw materials it can get. Um, but in this case, we're not building a mine. Um, we're building a renewable energy plant with lithium extraction on the back end. So we have a very, very small land footprint. We talked about uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Sounds like an exciting term, CBAM for short. Um, but this really is um, a bit of a game changer. Um, the US is also looking at uh, introducing something similar. Um, and this is so, you know, carbon emissions, as they have been in the past with, um, with China, aren't sort of offshored 
uh, from places like Europe. So the products that you buy in Europe, they need to have a carbon cost. Um, and that will, we expect that to roll out um, into the US as well under the Biden administration. We calculate that for, um, for hard rock, that could add 15% um, potentially uh, to the, uh, the price of the finished product. So pretty significant. Um, just in terms of uh, revenues, as I said, um, there is a fixed feed-in tariff for geothermal energy in Germany. Um, that's to support uh, geothermal energy production. Um, it is fixed for, for 20 years, and it's 25.2 euro cents uh, per kilowatt hour. Um, lithium prices um, also, as we've heard mentioned, are, are doing well at the moment, and we expect that to continue in the future. So um, that provides solid underpinnings for the project. Um, that gives rise to um, the results from our pre-feasibility study, which show um, pretty attractive project financials for the uh, businesses separated as a renewable energy and the chemicals business. Um, we also combine these um, uh, at the back of this presentation as well, just to show what that looks like, and also very attractive indeed. And you can see the energy business is more like an infrastructure asset um, with that sort of lower rate of return, but obviously much more stable um, uh, returns. Um, so a different, potentially a different type of investor there. I'm very pr proud of our team. Um, we have on our board the ex-Tesla uh, head of the battery and energy supply chain. Um, we have Horst, who founded the company with me, Dr. Horst Kreuter, um, one of Germany's leading geothermal experts, started the first geothermal development company in Germany in the late 90s, um, really brings uh, a whole career of geothermal um, experience. Um, Dr. Heidi Grön, um, senior German chemicals executive. Um, Josephine Bush was um, the global lead for EY Renewables. Um, Rani al Kadamani our ESG um, and communications expert. Um, so we've really got a fantastic team. Um, and I'm also, also proud to say that uh, our board is two thirds uh, female. <laughs> um, we have a very strong uh, executive and development team as well. We have about 60 people in the company now. Um, so mostly out in Germany, um, because that's where the project is. Um, and leading the businesses on the energy side, Torsten Weimann is COO. Um, and Dr. Stephen Harrison on the lithium side as CTO, um, really tremendous um, technical and operating experience there. Vincent as well, uh, Vincent Pedias uh, is um, uh, a lithium expert, um, a lithium markets expert, is leading the charge on our offtake uh, negotiations um, and um, has previously been appointed by the EU as a lithium expert, so very well respected in the, sp in the space. Um, so we've really got a fantastic team, um, both technically and commercially, to take this forward. Just quickly on timeline, so uh, we've just finished our pre-feasibility study. We are going as fast as we can. We're really going at breakneck speed, but um, uh, we have our, our BFS or DFS, depending on your terminology, our definitive feasibility study um, ahead of us. We're aiming to get that completed by middle of next year, all going well. Um, in the meantime, we have um, more exploration to do. We need to do some more seismic surveys to tighten up our drill planning. Um, we need to get our offtake agreements in place, that's still ahead of us, so that's going to be exciting. Um, and we need obviously the requisite um, permits as well, and then we just get that um, staged development of the project towards first production. Um, share price and cap structure, it's been a pretty crazy ride over the last um, 12 to 18 months. Um, we, uh, we've performed very well, I think, and I think that's largely in part to um, really starting with the zero carbon um, objective and working backwards from there. Um, I think there's been a, a really sort of a hunger for that with investors and pleased to have um, very well respected institutional investors on our, on our register, such as Hancock Prospecting, um, one of the most successful um, Australian private companies. Um, we also have BMP's Energy Transition Fund as well. Um, we have just under 120 million in cash um, through our raise in February um, with Goldman Sachs um, and Canaccord. Um, so we are well funded uh, to final investment decision FID. And that's it. So world's first and only zero carbon lithium process and project Europe's largest lithium resource. Um, and Europe is the world's fastest growing lithium market. We are supported by um, an EU backed body, EIT Inno Energy as well. Um, we expect strong support going forwards, both in Germany and in the EU. Um, very low cost uh, project. Um, uh, so, as I said, it doesn't necessarily need to cost more to go green. Um, strong cash position, right team for the job, and moving forwards very quickly. Thank you very much.